Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, great to see uh, quite a lot of interest in this issue, which is terrific. Um, my name is Michael Calabrese, and I'm a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation in the Open Technology Initiative, and I direct our Wireless, wireless Future Project. Uh, and we've been, of course, pushing for uh, more open and efficient uh, spectrum policies for, for many years and for more competitive mobile broadband markets. So this is really an issue that brings those two uh, together for us. Um, our topic today, uh, maybe our topic question, is can the FCC, FCC convert satellite spectrum into mobile broadband competition? And uh, at least at New America and among some of the uh, consumer and the public interest groups we work with, I think the answer, you know, for us is, is yes, but uh, we're going to hear some, uh, some different perspectives from stakeholders that are affected uh, by that. And we're going to begin uh, with remarks from the man who's really at the cutting edge of that effort, uh, Sanjeev Ahuja, who's the chairman and CEO of LightSquared, uh, a new company that's uh, using mobile satellite spectrum to build out uh, LTE nationwide. At least that is um, the hope. And then we'll have um, an expert panel uh, f following uh, Sanjeev, and, and he will join then in a, you know, with the discussion, some Q&A. And then at the very end, uh, we have uh, Reed Hunt, the former chairman of the FCC, who you, most of you know, uh, coming to, uh, to offer uh, his perspective on uh, wireless competition and, and these issues. So I think that'll be a very, very interesting way to tie it up at the end. Just as a incredibly short, because we want to move this along, we have so much good material here, but uh, the, the very short context for this, of course, is that a bit over a year ago, the National Broadband Plan, you know, made uh, freeing up another 500 megahertz of spectrum, a real centerpiece, or some would say centerfold, of, uh, of that plan. And really, as I'll talk about a little bit later, um, crucial to that on the, on the non-federal side of spectrum was to make better use of the mobile satellite bands, which have been largely fallow, um, and they've been burdened by um, certain requirements uh, related to integrated handset using satellite and terrestrial components uh, in an integrated fashion. And nobody's been really uh, able to make a very good uh, business out of that. And meanwhile, there's 90 megahertz of spectrum in the L band and the S band that are badly needed uh, to promote uh, mobile broadband competition. So the National Broadband Plan recommended that there should be a greater flexibility given to um, uh, to licensees, to operators in those bands to see if it couldn't get pushed to a higher, better use. And really the first company that stepped forward with, a, with an actual plan uh, to do that uh, is, uh, you know, is LightSquared. And they were uh, given, uh, the licenses were transferred to them and they were given a waiver uh, in order to uh, proceed uh, with their plan, which, which Sanjeev will uh, describe to you. So. I want to in, uh, begin by uh, introducing uh, Sanjeev, who has uh, really has a deep background in in this well in this whole field. He's one of the world's most accomplished mobile telecom executives and entrepreneurs. He's been at this game uh, for as long as it's been going. I think uh, a good 20 years or more. Um, he has a deep background in the U.S. market, having moved in the 90s from. IBM to become president of Belcor, which became Telcordia. Uh, and then he left there uh, in 2004. He became the chief executive officer of Orange until 2007. And at, and at Orange, uh, Orange is one of the leading uh, wireless providers in Europe, of course. And he led them to 105 million uh, subscribers by the time he left, which is more than Verizon has. Uh, even today, which is quite something. He also began kind of his, I think what's become his new passion of extending uh, mobile connectivity into difficult areas that 
that were unserved and in most cases do not even have a good wireline infrastructure. So at Orange, he was responsible for um, expanding their deployments into Eastern Europe and Africa. And then after he left, uh, founded uh, Auger, a company that delivers um, affordable broadband to underserved customers in developing markets such as Pakistan and Bangladesh, tough places. But he decided to, to one-up that again uh, by founding uh, Eaton Telecom, which he chairs, uh, which is a telecom infrastructure uh, company with a presence in 12 African countries. And I, I guess maybe, maybe the ultimate challenge for affordable broadband is the United States, because he seems to want to cap off his, uh, his efforts here with a nationwide open wholesale network. At least we all hope. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to Sanjeev. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, my thanks also to New America Foundation uh, for inviting me here today. Um, I actually, this is, I relate to what you said in more ways than one. U.S. is now approaching around 100% mobile, or 100% mobile penetration. And I'll just give you a context. Uh, I think city of Mumbai got there a couple of years ago uh, in terms of more than 100% mobile penetration. Uh, and the uh, city of Delhi is probably 105, 110% today. So I'm just trying to put it in context. Uh, wireless services, quality of wireless services in the United States today, I uh, find it hard to compete with uh, wireless services in uh, most of Western Europe. And I may venture to see even, say even with Eastern Europe. So we are live in a fairly challenged environment in terms of mobile connectivity. However, let me get back to the question that you posed and you answered on the behalf of uh, at least your perspective. Can the FCC convert satellite spectrum into wireless competition? And my answer simply is yes, it can. But it is a qualified yes. FCC cannot do it alone. FCC can create a regulatory and policy environment that attracts the investment to bring more spectrum to market and increase competition in wireless services. That's what FCC has done and did it in case of MSS spectrum in 2003. And that is allowing us to build a ground network using our satellite spectrum. But what FCC cannot do is invest money into building a network like this. What it cannot do is hire engineers. What it cannot do is hire professionals needed to build the network. And what it cannot do is hire people to manage and operate the network. And what FCC cannot do is realistically mandate the changes that the industry must go through in the coming years if it is to meet the challenges that we have in front of us in terms of providing affordable, reliable service to our customers because they are simply demanding it. The demand exists out there and we as an industry have to step up. Make no mistake, what the industry does need is an FCC that understands and is responsive to the needs of both the consumers and the industry. But the nation also needs, if I may, companies like Light Squared that are willing to make the investment, willing to stay committed, and willing to serve the consumers the way the consumers are demanding to be served today. And let me explain to you what we have already done on our side and what we are planning to do over the next few months and years. We started this process 10 years ago. Light Squared and its predecessors did that. So it's been a long journey we've been on. We asked FCC to change the rules for mobile satellite service and allow the use of the satellite spectrum in a terrestrial network. After the FCC wrote the rules, in 2003, we began 
the long hard work of bringing our service to market. It took seven years to coordinate the spectrum so that it could be used for a wireless broadband network. Coordination with Inmarsat, coordination with Mexico, coordination with Russia. Lots of work has gone in and lots of time has been spent. We designed a new chipset. We designed and launched next generation satellite. That work that I just walked you through took well over a billion dollars of investment on our part. Several proceedings at the FCC and obviously almost a decade of work. The end result, 59 megahertz of nationwide spectrum usable for terrestrial and satellite service. I mention this so we can, not that we can pat ourselves on the back. I would actually prefer if our customers and ultimately American consumer did that. I mention it because this investment of time and resources were necessary for us to help meet today's major challenges in this industry, namely spectrum, shortage, and competition. It is easy to talk about these policy issues, specifically in Washington, as if they were relatively abstract notions that we were discussing. I assure you, however, these issues are very real and have a direct impact on American consumers, on you and I, and, and, and on our families as we use these services. Even in 2011, it is possible to be walking down on Park Avenue, an office that I work out of one or two days a week, and not have wireless connectivity. I, on an average, every three-minute call that I make, I drop it once or twice, even today in downtown Manhattan. Never mind being in a rural location where sometimes connectivity just isn't even possible. And that's today. Tomorrow, the problem will be worse. U.S. wireless data usage is expected to grow 4,000% in the next four years. Our current spectrum is severely limited, with a shortfall, as Michael was mentioning. People are saying anywhere between 500 megahertz to as much as 1.7 gigahertz by the end of this decade. United States should be rightfully the global leader in delivering wireless broadband to everyone. But that is not the case. Rural communities and poor communities have been totally left out of the benefits of access to wireless and broadband networks. To its credit, the administration does understand the importance of the issue. In his State of the Union address, President Obama said that making broadband available for 98% of Americans is essential to, quote, winning the future. We have seen both FCC and the NTIA do good work over the last many years, but specifically over the last two years in this direction. The National Broadband Plan was a comprehensive plan that essentially brings all the whole range, a very broad range of issues to the table, but it focuses specifically on wireless. I applaud both FCC and NTIA for their work together to identify spectrum resources that already exist that could be brought to commercial use to help alleviate some of the challenges we are facing. These steps are absolutely necessary, but they are not sufficient. For too long, our industry has relied on the FCC to what I call waving the spectrum wand and making more spectrum and resources available. This is a mindset that is based on years of having more than enough spectrum resources to address the demand, even during the times of rapid wireless growth in this country. It is the mindset that can, leads to a continuing singular focus on how many megahertz can be available 
in what period of time, and places less emphasis on other issues that are equally critical to us, us in this industry and people like ourselves that are here. How do we as an industry make smarter use of what we already have? How do we bring underused spectrum to market? How do we design both, not just our transmitters, but also our receivers in order to maximize the use of the spectrum that is already there? And perhaps most importantly, is today's wireless industry the wireless industry the United States needs in the future? I submit to you that no, it isn't. The traditional wireless business model has been vertically integrated. The top industry players manage every single component of the value chain, from the network to device subsidies to customer acquisition to brand, marketing, customer care, every single element of the value chain. And they have done it for the last 150 years. The business model has not changed one iota. Light squared breaks this model open. We will operate only as a wholesaler, selling access to our network through our retail distribution partners, who in turn will go resell the service to the end consumer under their own brand, under their own marketing umbrella, under their own sales channel. We will not compete with our customers with the retail service. Our model is a unique horizontal approach that will open the wireless market to a very wide variety of new entrants. Our model will enable wireless retailers to focus on the retail relationship. We will replace ownership of the network with access to a reliable broadband network at costs that are comparable to the cost of ownership. And this will significantly reduce the cost of entry into the wireless business and enable dozens of smaller competitors to enter the market who could never do this before in the history of this industry. So we will enable wireless and rural companies who will not have their own 4G nationwide network, like Leap, like Cellular South, to bring their customers wireless broadband services that our network will deliver. National retailers can offer hardware with already embedded wireless connectivity at their point of purchase, allowing them to develop an ongoing relationship with their end customer. Our partnership with Best Buy is an early but significant example of what is to come. All of these new wireless players can offer connectivity at a fair and affordable cost to the consumer without having to compete with the company that supplies them their bandwidth. Let's think of more basic access. Do you remember a few years ago when all of a sudden convenience stores were selling cell phone calling cards? One day they just weren't on the shelves and the other day the shelves are full of those calling cards. Well, we hope with Light Squared in the market, buying a broadband enabled service will be just as easy and hopefully even easier at a convenience store, at a grocery store, at any retail outlet and getting access to wireless broadband under dozens to hundreds of brands that are not in the business today. By making this access to the network affordable, our pricing also enables companies that target prepaid consumers who are watching their budgets, who are watching their wireless spending. Our roaming agreement with wireless carrier Leap is a concrete demonstration of how our approach broadens and deepens access to the network across all consumer types. And here's a little bit of thought to those of you who are engaged in what I call favorite beltway discussion of access to networks. An open wholesale model can only succeed 
if it is, well, open. And light squared is open. Anyone who wants to bring a device into our network will be able to do so. We have already developed data devices, modems, hotspots, routers, that will work on the light squared network. But that is just the beginning. Our partners, indeed anyone, will be able to come to, starting with our Silicon Valley-based, what we call Innovation Sandbox, and our leader is right here, Patrick Parody, where they're welcome to come, design, and test their products, applications, services to connect to our network. It doesn't matter whether they're a major electronics company or a startup working out of a garage. We will make our network available to them to test and develop those devices and products to play, to create, to innovate. So we aren't limiting device innovation, application innovation, services innovation, service creativity to light squared engineers. We are opening it up to anybody, anybody, anywhere in the world can use their creativity and start using our network to deliver their services to end consumer. What I'm talking about today is how Light Squared, we believe, will drive a fundamental change in the structure of the wireless industry. And I'm speaking to you as a realist, not as a wild-eyed optimist. This kind of network does not, however, appear overnight. Remember FCC rules do not make a network? It took us almost 10 years of work and billions of dollars of investment to get where we are today. And the work isn't over, not by a long shot. To comply with FCC requirements, we are committed to cover 100 million American citizens by the end of next year, 145 million by the end of 2013, and 260 million by the end of 2015. To hit these marks, we are committing to spend $14 billion in network infrastructure, deployment, and operations over the next eight years. That's $14 billion of private investment in the U.S. infrastructure. I've talked about the spectrum we are bringing, the business model we are using, and the investment we are making. This is the template for how you use satellite spectrum to spark competition in the wireless arena. But let, let's not forget it is indeed satellite spectrum we are using and that we are under an obligation to continue to ensure that there is a robust satellite service in the United States. We have spent over a billion dollars to create a unique integrated networks infrastructure. The satellite we launched in November 2010, represents a significant investment in U.S. technology leadership. That is the satellite with the largest commercial antenna ever deployed anywhere in the world. Because of that investment, consumers will be able to reach the satellite with the identical wireless device that they use today to connect to the terrestrial network. Same device, same form factor, same power usage, and hopefully same pricing. So it's important to understand that our service brings competition in wireless, but it also serves two other vital public policy goals because of our satellite DNA. First, light squared will enhance public safety. When the ground network is not available or when it's been compromised, you will still be able to get both voice and data service as long as you can look at the sky. We offer a single integrated price to our consumers, our customers, because the cost of satellite is a part of our overall cost of the network, and it is not recovered on a standalone basis. The result, a satellite capability that can be put in the hands of every American 
at a very affordable price. This is a crucial capability that will benefit individual consumers as well as the public safety community. We've been working with public safety, as you all know, for a decade and a half now, providing satellite services. We understand the needs of that community, and we will continue to listen to its needs as we deploy our next generation network, both satellite and terrestrial. Indeed, LightSquared has already taken steps to drive access to our satellite communications in case of emergencies. Most recently, we created an emergency rapid response team that can deploy to disaster-stricken areas and provide responders satellite communications capability immediately. Second, Light Squared service will bring broadband capability to rural areas. Our nationwide spectrum allows our partners to build out in rural territories and then have the benefit of access to a nationwide network at same affordable rates that we offer to everyone else. Again, a first in this industry. Our service is specifically attractive because of the satellite component, which allows coverage even in the remotest parts of this country outside the range of any terrestrial network. Border areas, national parks, and other remote areas near rural carriers will now be able to offer nationwide service and nationwide connectivity. For the first time, Americans will be able to talk and send emails, whether they are in the middle of Grand Canyon, Yellowstone National Park, or hopefully Park Avenue. Moreover, access to our national network will dramatically reduce the roaming cost of rural guys, rural carriers. Because of these advantages of our network, Cellular South, Southern Illinois, and open range communications are now our partners. And we look forward to making many more announcements of our rural partnerships in the coming weeks. Moreover, Light Squared provides equipment and connectivity to the Indian Health Service, the lead federal agency serving the health needs of American Indian and Alaska Native persons to address the lack of reliable communications connectivity that often plagues tribal communities even today in this country. So the answer to the question, Michael, you posed today is yes. FCC can create wireless competition out of satellite spectrum if companies like Light Squared step up to the challenge. What we are doing today is a realization of the promise of the rules that were established in 2003. It is also the realization of FCC's national broadband plan, which states that broadband can and must serve as a foundation for long-term economic growth, ongoing investment, and enduring job creation. Light Square has accepted the challenge. We are supporting the National Broadband Plan to connect America and Americans, sparking innovation, creating economic opportunities, and driving job growth. We have exactly the right approach and exactly the right time to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, Sanjeev. Great overview. Um, all right, so I'd like to ask our panelists to come up, and I will turn things over uh, to my colleague and friend, Sasha Meinrath, who directs New America's Open Technology Initiative. And Sasha has, among his many areas of expertise, uh, wireless and spectrum as well, which is why he came aboard initially with us. And uh, he'll moderate. I'll join the panel, and uh, we're going to get some uh, some very short remarks from the panelists and then get into a discussion, Q&A, and Reed Hunt at the end. Sasha? Thanks, Michael. So when I first heard about Light Squared, I, as a technologist, was, of course, deeply intrigued by this hybrid model that's being put out. 
But I thought, like, you know, what are they going to do? They, they would need a satellite. And then they launched one. And then all of a sudden, I started taking them very seriously. <laughs> um, and I have to admit, you know, as you can imagine, as the director of something called the Open Technology Initiative, this vision that you've laid out for an open, ubiquitous, affordable wireless network covering the entire country, the targeting key problems, Indian health services and, and the sorry state of, of connectivity in Indian country, public safety, et cetera. This is profoundly uh, interesting. And so when I think about what we're talking about today, I ask myself, could we be looking at something akin to sort of a, a wireless renaissance? And so joining us today, I feel like we've got a panel made up of thought leaders and visionaries, uh, people whose work is going to directly impact the very future of, of these communications and help define what this renaissance might look like. So in order to maximize their speaking time, I'm actually going to give sort of the briefest of intros. It's actually what one former uh, keynoter with us once likened to the epitaph of biographies. So I'll just go down the line. Uh, Bill Ingram is the senior VP for Leap Wireless. Uh, Purul Desai is the Communications Policy Council for Communi Consumers Union. Uh, you may have read Consumer Reports. That's all her. She puts it out herself. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Lawrence Crever is the VP of Legal and Government Affairs for Sprint Nextel, uh, which of course has been a key player in a lot of this. Uh, Nita, uh, Nita Bidwai, is the Senior Policy Advisor to Senator Mark Warner, uh, the Democrat from Virginia. And of course, my colleague Michael Calabrese, uh, who's been in this space for over a decade now, uh, fighting the good fight to open up spectrum to innovative use. And I'm going to turn it over to them to make sort of a brief, you know, two, three odd minute introductory remarks on sort of their thoughts around this issue, and then allow uh, for Sanjiv to respond uh, with any thoughts or, or further uh, vision that you'd like to give. And then we'll turn it over to all of you for Q&A. So why don't we just start here and we can move right down the line. Bill? Great. Thanks, Sasha. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Bill Ingram. Uh, I'll take my two minutes to tell you very briefly about our business and our views on uh, uh, Spectrum. Uh, we operate a uh, branded service called Cricket, and man, many of you may have heard of it here in San, uh, in San Diego, in uh, Washington, D.C. We cover about 100 million uh, people in the United States, which is about a third of the United States. Major cities are Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, D.C., places like that. Uh, we offer an unlimited service, so uh, for $40 to $50 a month, you can get unlimited voice, data, text, uh, 3G services. Uh, and we have about 6 million customers. So in the grand order of things, we're not one of the larger players, but uh, we are uh, significant and uh, fill a very uh, important uh, service area for uh, wireless customers in the United States. Um, one of the things uh, about our customers I'm very proud of is our customers are very smart. Uh, they uh, watch their budgets very closely. Uh, they are no dummies, and uh, they get good value. Uh, probably like many of you, uh, I travel a lot. And, the other morning I was traveling to the airport early in a taxi and asked the taxi driver where he's from. He said, Ethiopia. I said, oh, that's great. I, I've been there. It's a beautiful country. And he asked me what I did. I said, well, I work for a wireless company. You've probably never heard of it. He says, no, tell me. I said, it's called Cricket. He said, Cricket, that's my phone. I said, thanks. He's driving. He says, all the Ethiopian taxi drivers use Cricket. <laughs> Thinking, how many are there? You know, more than I thought. We're driving along. I said, well, thank you. Six million. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I said, thank you. And uh, we're driving along. He says, uh, should I uh, buy the stock in your company? I said, what? I said, what? I, said I, I can't give you investment advice. He said, well, I, I, was, I was watching, and uh, your price-earnings ratio is very attractive, and you're four of them. <laughs> I said, who are you? Uh, but my point is, uh, our customers I'm very proud of. They're very smart. The $20, $30, $40, $50 dollars a month that we save is crucially important to them. They have families, they have jobs, and wireless connectivity is essential to their livelihoods. In terms of spectrum, uh, we uh, have announced and we will launch 4G services in our 100 million covered POPs, but our dilemma, as you may know, is this industry, is, for an operator like us, is driven by uh, access to capital and spectrum. And while we've been able to access capital successfully and expect we will continue, uh, spectrum's a dilemma. We have about 20 megahertz on average across all our markets, and we've tried to keep 
10 megahertz of that available for LTE, but as our growth has continued, we're creeping into that space. And uh, so when we launch our 4G LTE services uh, in the next two years, we frankly won't have enough spectrum depth to make it competitive. Um, as you know, Verizon has announced uh, nationwide 4G and 20 megahertz of spectrum. They got another 20 megahertz in their back pocket. Uh, so even when we launch, we will be disadvantaged because of our lack of spectrum. And the FCC, despite all their good work and broadband plan, has 300 to 500 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, it's just not available. It's delayed for all sorts of reasons, and we track that, but it's just not there. And as uh, Sanjeev said earlier, as a realist, we have to get into service. We have to provide this service. So our agreement with Light Squared uh, uh, was first and early because we are a very innovative company. Uh, we provide great value to our very smart customers. And um, we look forward to uh, this type of model to frankly cobble together a network that uh, we, uh, we need to provide these services nationwide. The basis of competition in the wireless service nationwide and we need access to spectrum, and this uh, looks like a good model for us. So with that, I'll turn it to my colleague. Thanks, Bill. Or what do you want to talk about what this means for consumers and et cetera? Sure, and I'll take my few minutes to talk about what we'd like to see for consumers. Um, at Consumers Union, what we always try to push for is obviously more choice for consumers, better service, and lower prices. Um, and in a functioning competitive market, I think those are the types of things that would see naturally come out of the uh, truly functioning competitive market. But in my experience, I think what I've seen is that the market isn't truly a functioning competitive market. Um, we see a lot of obstacles, and I think one of the obstacles that we're talking about today is the access to spectrum. And so I think it's good to see a model like this, regardless of whether it's LightSquare or somebody else, that can create a model like this, I think, is always a good thing because that diminishes one obstacle. But I think there are other obstacles that continue to be out there, and I think in, in addition to what we're doing here today, talking about the spectrum issues, I think what's important to us is that even if we get beyond the issue of spectrum, we also see issues with what Light Squared is having with some of the encumbrances that they see right now. But beyond that, I think we can't neglect and oversee that there are other issues that we have to address in the market. There are issues like um, roaming, which I think a lot of people have already talked about. There's issues with backhaul, special access. There are high rates that competitors pay for that. Um, there are issues with just getting handsets that consumers want. We see more and more that consumers are more attached to their handsets than their service provider. So I think these are the other issues that we have to continue to be talking about. I think a model that we're talking about today is good and it could help, but we have to keep thinking about what are the other issues that competitors are facing, smaller competitors are facing that inhibits them from truly competing in the market and inhibits consumers from benefiting from lower prices, from more choices, whether it's choices in the application market, choices in the device market, as well as better service. Con consumers still continue to face poor customer service. So I think these are issues that we have to continue to look at. And as my colleague here mentioned, consumers are smart. And consumers know when they're not benefiting or when they're when they feel constrained. They may not always know the policy reasons behind why they're still facing high early termination fees or why they can't get the handset that they want. Consumers Union recently did an interoperability survey that overwhelmingly found that if consumers had a choice, they would love to be able to just take their phone from one provider to another, which as we move towards LTE should be more possible. So these are the types of issues that we're looking at and we're hoping um, in addition to some of the topics that we talk about today, we continue to address the other issues that I think exist in the market to ensure that we do have a fully functioning competitive market so that we can see lower prices, more choices, um, and better customer service. Thank you, Parul. Uh, Lawrence, I, I know Sprint Nextel is, you know, one of the big four here in the United States. Yeah. So I'm very curious to hear sort of fr from the incumbency seat. Uh, what you think about all of this and, and what you guys are working on. Well, uh, let, let me start by, by saying that Sanjeev said something that um, really resonated with me. He said that Light Squared uh, could be a fundamental change in the structure of the wireless industry. A fundamental change in the structure of the wireless industry. I was in a, a hearing room on the United States Senate Judiciary Committee, Antitrust Subcommittee yesterday, and we were looking at and hearing about another potentially fundamental change in the structure of the wireless industry. What a breath of fresh air it is here today, in contrast to yesterday.
because in that fundamental change, we would have a duopoly where we would be one of the kind of smaller of the big three by immense quantity, uh, where we would see a duopoly with 80% of the wireless revenue in the country, 88% of the profit, immense ability to influence the price of handsets, availability of handsets, availability to get new and, and exciting handsets, control of the landline network, which of course means special access and backhaul costs, all of that meaning that whether it's Sprint, <coughs> whether it's Cricket, whether it's Metro, whether it's anybody else, our cost of service will be hostage to the immense market power of that duopoly. So it's very nice to be here today and here instead a fundamental change which would add capacity to the industry rather than take capacity away, which would use spectrum more efficiently rather than simply take out a competitor to plug their spectrum into an inefficient spectrum model that operates multiple networks in a way that is reminiscent of the last decade rather than the capabilities moving forward. Just as Sanjeev talked about, we at, Next, at Sprint Nextel are working very hard to use our spectrum resources more efficiently, and many of you are aware of our network vision project in which we'll, inve we'll invest three to five billion dollars over the next three years to fundamentally remake our entire network, to move from two networks today to one network, which can also host other spectrum, for example, possibly Clearwire or possibly public safety spectrum, and in which we can deploy our spectrum in, in all of our spectrum into whichever technology we want to use it on and use it more efficiently. We can take our 800 in IDEN today and use it, for example, in our CDMA network. And it's a much greener technology, much lower use of energy, carbon footprint, lower air conditioning costs, better use of the spectrum, better coverage, et cetera. So we're investing in getting more out of the spectrum, which I think our entire industry has to do because obviously as time goes on, we're all going to need more spectrum. So I think it's great to be talking today about Light Squared and, and how its model can make a fundamental change which will redound to the benefit of consumers and competition in America and jobs as opposed to a proposal which would do all of the opposite of those things if it's approved. Thank you, Lawrence. Nita, perhaps you can give us a, a bit of a view from the hill and the rarefied air up there when it comes to <laughs> wireless competition and That's a uh, tall order. to play here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nita Bidway. I work for Senator Mark Warner of Virginia. Um, Virginia, as I'm sure many of you are probably constituents of ours, um, as you know, is a it's a state with a rich history in telecom, and Senator Warner, of course, has a very long-standing interest and um, expertise in the area of spectrum. Um, I think, given his interest in rural broadband deployment and in um, access to technology, um, this is a you know this is an issue that we give a lot of thought to. Um, and if you look at at his work since he's come to the Senate, I think he spent a lot of time looking at spectrum availability, both in the public sector and also um, from the private sector, really wanting spectrum to be at its highest use. Um, and he, uh, you know, I, th I think has taken a number of positions that are probably non-traditional in this respect. But I think he feels like that's the you know that's the the real success of the telecom market in the US, that it's very much driven by innovation and competitiveness, but at the same time, it's not something that you know, I think he would take for granted. So I think seeing um, the possibility of, of additional innovation in this sector is very important to him. And it's particularly important um, uh, for a state like Virginia. I mean, it's a highly urbanized, um, very well-connected uh, series of networks in areas where you know, probably everyone in this room lives. Um, and then we have Southwest Virginia, which is isolated. It's part of Appalachia. It has a very different story. And frankly, um, you know, satellite is probably one of the, the better options for areas like that, um, particularly in terms of having seamless coverage for users. So these are issues that we've taken a lot of, um, of interest in, and, and you know, hopefully there are a lot of options for, for users. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so there's several reasons that um, you know, that New America has uh, supported MSS band uh, flexibility and the waiver uh, granted to Light Squared, and those include um, spectrum policy, the conditions, in, the conditions impose a substantial price that's tailored to optimize the public interest, more so than an auction would have, 
uh, and competition policy. So first, uh, spectrum policy, you know, as I think most people know, there's a very limited amount of beachfront spectrum left that we will be able to uh, auction on an exclusive basis uh, for the sort of business models used today by the wireless carriers. We're running out of it. So the National Broadband Plan, of course, aspires to 500 megahertz uh, more, below 3.7. But of this, you, you know, note that they only identified 270 coming from non-federal spectrum. And of that, three quarters of the non-federal spectrum uh, is, is said to be coming from broadcasting and from mobile satellite spectrum. Uh, now, the 120 megahertz from broadcasting seems fairly unlikely, uh, I mean, to that extent, maybe to some extent, and it's going to take three to five years if we're lucky. Uh, this means that the 90 megahertz of uh, MSS spectrum in the L band, uh, which we're talking about here today, and the S band, which is actually less encumbered, are by far the largest bands that could be available the soonest for uh, the next generation of mobile broadband. Uh, but only if policy creates incentives for rapid build-out. Remember, we have uh, cable companies and others that are still sitting on large quantities of great spectrum back from the 2006 auctions five years later. Therefore, the condition that obligates LightSquared to cover 260 million Americans by, 20, by the end of 2015 is an aggressive and much-needed condition that has never been placed on an auctioned band of spectrum. The second reason um, is the, the particular conditions. So not just the, uh, the build-out, but most importantly, the, uh, this idea of an open wholesale uh, network. Um, but, but, uh, but, uh, and I'll come back, come back to that in one second. But as we said in our, in our pleading on this, and, and I think as Sanjeev, Sanjeev mentioned, there's also a whole bunch of other costly conditions that are associated uh, with this uh, license and this waiver, such as the 300 and, uh, roughly $350 million paid to Inmarsat to reorganize the narrow and interleave channels on the L-band into the large contiguous blocks that Sanjeev mentioned. So Sanjeev is actually, by shorthanding, he's actually glossed over some of the really difficult stuff they have to do because that whole band is like, you know, light squared, Inmarsat, light squared, Inmarsat, you know, like this, and they have to reorganize the whole thing there was $600 million to launch an LTE-capable satellite, $50 million to integrate, uh, to develop integrated uh, devices and base stations, and on and on. Finally, uh, the, the kind of final and most important reason that we've supported this is the conditions placed on the grant of flexibility reflect the policy choice to promote mobile market competition in the best possible way, which is through an open wholesale network. So our Public Interest Spectrum Coalition has been calling on the FCC to do this with a new grant of spectrum since 2007. That was our initial ask on the C block in the, in the 700 megahertz auction, and we got the sort of Carter phone open access conditions instead as sort of a fallback. Uh, we supported the frontline proposal, you know, that was spearheaded by Reed Hunt, uh, which was going to be an open wholesale network with public safety, which didn't work out. And M2Z, we were sympathetic to their desire to do the same thing, an open wholesale network, which, you know, the FCC just sat on. So while an open wholesale network will not cure all the ills of this increasingly consolidated mobile market, it greatly strengthens the hand of the smaller and regional carriers, as we've just heard. Longer term, the availability of a carrier offering connectivity as a commodity at wholesale prices creates intriguing possibilities for, for innovation among a wide range of companies in adjacent markets. So, for example, imagine, imagine, uh, it's hard to believe, but imagine if, like, a, if a powerful company acquired Skype and, <laughs> and maybe they have, maybe they sell a lot of devices like Xboxes and they have op, an operating system and you could have free, free phone calling Right, right, phone calls don't take much spectrum, right? And if there was a wholesale network that could carry those calls with their little bits of spectrum, and that would be kind of a nice loss leader, uh, out Googling Google, perhaps. Or imagine a, 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 you know, a popular innovative mobile device and software company that actually wanted to sell directly to the consumer and not have to pay a pound of flesh 
to the, t to the two dominant carriers. Um, Steve Jobs, uh, <laughs> come, come back. I, you know, I, I think if this network had been available, uh, that's exactly what they would have done. So, so, so finally, let me just stop. I'm, I'm going longer than the others, but wanted to get out that um, I think both the recent roaming order and this, uh, and this flexibility and waiver you know, represent the glimmer of a much needed competition policy at the FCC. I think as we'll hear shortly from Reed, back in the mid-1990s, the FCC shaped the emerging mobile telephone market with a very conscious competition policy that included things like spectrum caps to ensure five, to six, five or six carriers per market. And so today, I think the most fundamental choice, for example, presented by the AT&T T-Mobile merger actually is do we, want, do we want to protect consumers and spur innovation through a competition policy uh, that ensures lots of different players competing, or do we want to revert to a duopoly and a much more heavy-handed type of, uh, of, of, of rate and service regulation, which is what we'll ultimately need if we're going to go back to having just uh, two, two or one carrier. So that's it. Great. Thank you, Michael. So we're going to open it up for audience questions momentarily, but before we do, I do want to give Sanjeeva an opportunity to reflect on, on what you've heard here thus far. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really good to hear from uh, my colleagues. And, uh, and what I hear is, is something that I think we all hear every day, multiple times a day. Give us a better quality network. Give us lower prices. Give us more competitive market serve the consumers, serve the needs, and create an environment which is conducive to innovation and creativity in this country. Those are big asks, but they're also very simple asks. I think that's true for not just our industry, that's true for any industry. Now we have, uh, you know, this is, I, I have esteemed colleagues here from Leap and Sprint, Nextel. Uh, and, and they are playing a significant role in providing that to, to the consumers. But I would say, if I just take better prices and better quality, and I'll just take a couple minutes on innovation, uh, because that actually is, is my favorite topic to talk about. Better prices, we are, uh, the price we are offering to our customers, in turn the people that will offer a consumer service, is something that's comparable to owner economics without them having to spend 10, 15, 20 billion dollars building a network. They can go compete with people that offer fully integrated end-to-end, -end, vertically integrated model. That will enable a lot of competition. Uh, the merger, uh, the, the, the new company that wants to, needs to, wants to get created, I don't know if it needs to get created, but wants to get created, often uses us as a goat competitor. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, I'm, I really feel honored to be considered a competitor uh, while we're, uh, you know, this is, uh, I, I say I put a, hand, a handful of base stations and I'm a nationwide competitor, so it's an, it's an honor to be in that position, but uh, hopefully we'll get there very quickly. But that is pricing. I think if we do that, you enable a lot of competition, you'll get better prices. Let me just spend a minute on quality. The network we are designing today, with, with all due respect, is the core design point is two concrete wall penetration and a moving elevator in every urban center in the United States. That has required us to spend, uh, allocate additional 25% capex to what we would if we were building a normally designed, average designed telecommunication network in the United States. We believe better quality, better consumer experience will lead to a better business for us. Let me talk about innovation and creativity. And this is what I really get excited about is when somebody walks in and says, if I had broadband service, this is what we would do. A camera manufacturer we are working with, they will embed our chip inside their device. And every time you take a picture, it gets uploaded to Flickr or Facebook or multiple servers in the cloud. 
you don't have to go home and tether that to your laptop or anything. This is the tons of examples like that I hear every day from either Patrick Parody or other parts of our business when people approach us say, I have a new service. I want my game always connected wirelessly. And why can't I use this when I'm sitting in the back of the car? Why can't I be playing a game? And they can do it in an affordable way with a better connected network. And those are the things that get me really excited. And I think all we're doing is, I hope there are other people like us, if there's more spectrum, other nationwide players that really help create a very innovative but very different business model for this industry. Thank you. So we have a standing room only crowd, which is incredible. I'll give you a quick tale of two perspectives here. I was talking with my wife on the way in this morning. She was like, can you do lunch? I said, no, I'm going to be doing this panel on wireless competition and innovative spectrum utilization. Her, th her statement to me was like, how many people could possibly be interested in this? <laughs> now, that's one perspective. On the other perspective, when Michael and I f arrived here, he walks into the room, looks at the chairs laid out, and he says, we're going to need more chairs. <laughs> so in honor of those of you that have been standing in the back there, I will start taking questions back and move my way forward. So please raise your hands if you have anything for any of the panelists up here. No one in the back has questions. This has been a very illuminating <coughs> panel, apparently. All right, we'll start here then. Uh, Jim Steyer from Spectrum PS, and I saw it. My question is primarily directed at Mars. Do we have a microphone? Yes, great. I think that Sanjeev and uh, Bill uh, <coughs> uh, might want to jump in. So I think there's a reason why uh, the telecom industry, mobile broadband uh, industry, is vertically integrated. As every first semester, uh, business school student learns uh, you don't want to invest uh, as a businessman in a company where you have a single supplier. We're not talking about a duopoly, which is what the public interest community is concerned about in regards to the um, consumer relationship with the vendor. We're talking about a businessman who has to choose to invest capital with a single supplier. That is a situation uh, rife with, with uh, at risk of moral hazard. And so, you know, at the FCC, you can say anything you want to get a license, nobody cares, and then renegotiate later when it proves uh, the FCC's not going to stipulate a business plan. Whatever is said today can change based on business realities. So my question to you, I know you went to the Harvard Business School. I'm sure you read Michael Porter, uh, his analysis, which deals with this question in at least 10 cases when you were there. I, would, I don't know what era you were, you were there. But how, how does a businessman like yourself, now you're in a very different situation because you already have 20 megahertz and this is just at the margin using a service like this. You're not talking about completely staking your business model on it. But what advice would you give to somebody else who wants to use as a wholesaler, Sanjeev's network, to protect themselves from the extraordinary position of moral hazard, as I understand the business plan has been presented, that they would enter it. Should they enter in a 10-year agreement with him? What type of promises? Now, if Sprint goes into this, we'll then have a duopoly. So that'll take away a hey, lot Jim, of could, the pressure. Could you sum up? But that's the, question to, that's the question to you. What advice would you give for somebody who wants to take advantage of this wonderful business proposition and deal with a monopoly provider? Maybe we'll have a duopoly if Sprint enters also All right, to protect so themselves. So that's the question. Let's give the panel a chance to answer this question. Sanjeev, you may want to suggest how somebody might protect themselves. From Thanks, Jim. <laughs> you, you mentioned Lawrence. That's Lawrence, or you, but you're looking at me. OK. <laughs> 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 you're, you're up next. <laughs> Uh, well, well, first of all, uh, I was there a long time ago, but I did take Mike Porter's class in his first few years. So uh, uh, he's a brilliant, uh, brilliant man and uh, had the great fortune of taking his course. Uh, you're right. Uh, our plan is not uh, exclusively for ourselves on light squared spectrum or network. We have, as I mentioned, about a third of the country covered. Uh, we're going to launch on our spectrum in that third of the country. We will wholesale off of Sanjeev Spectrum in the other two-thirds of the country. And more than likely, if uh, another competitor emerges with a similar type offering, uh, we will enter in discussions with them. There's no exclusivity to your point in uh, making a critical uh, business decision. But 
For example, today we use uh, multiple providers for handsets. We don't use only Nokia or Motorola uh, or one vendor or another. But as you would imagine, uh, you tend to uh, work with a majority of your, uh, uh, of your uh, consumption or of your uh, purchases. So maybe 70 or 80 percent of our uh, uh, wholesale spectrum needs will go to the uh, operator that is you know, best position and best price and best services us. So your, your point's correct. We would never uh, place our business solely on the back of, uh, uh, you know, of one provider. On the other hand, uh, tr to try to answer your question about uh, what would a new entrant do who doesn't, doesn't have those options, uh, certainly you have to take a risk at some point. I've started two companies in my life and I've made some very risky decisions. I can tell you one was a huge failure. I lost everybody's money. Second one turned out pretty good. So you can never determine exactly uh, where you, know, you can balance your risk. But if I were starting a new broadband wholesale provider and Sanji offered me a good service, good price, good coverage, I'd probably start with him but very quickly try to uh, balance and diversify my risk with an agreement with Sprint, for example. Sprint has a very large wholesale business. It's probably the largest wholesaler in the country. We do business with Sprint's wholesale team. I've negotiated, it was publicly announced, we committed to $350 million guaranteed deal with Sprint. So those of us that are, I might say, unaligned between the, the duopoly players uh, really need to work together, and there seems to be more opportunity to do that. Jim, I think uh, yeah, this is, if, if my, with, with due respect, I did read Michael Porter's class, uh, core book, but I didn't take his class. I didn't go to Harvard, so. Uh, although we're in the Harvard Club building, I think. Uh, uh, so, l l let me just say this. I think if you take that to an extreme, that says if a new innovator comes in, don't ever adopt a new innovator in an industry until somebody else comes in with the same innovation. And no, I think the other thing, the point you're making is, if there is a disruptor in the market, which is disrupting the market on price, quality, service, don't adopt it until you get somebody who competes with the, with the disruptor in the market. So I think that theory fails on these two points very clearly. However, in our market, in the business what we are providing, we have AT&T, we have Verizon, we have T-Mobile, at least today, we have Sprint, and we have other operators. Why not even Leap in its region? So there are options available. When customers choose to go to a wholesale-only offer, yes, there is not a competitor that we have today that is purely wholesale business. That helps our economics and opens up the market. But where I sit, I welcome more wholesalers to get in. I think that will create competition for us, keep us sharper. It'll provide choices to our customers and therefore more choices to the consumer. I think it's a great environment to be in. But it's, nobody's beholden to us and nobody should be because they do have choices today, although the choices with the, with the top two may not be competitive on price, quality, service, but they are choices and they can make those choices. Thank you. Go right here. Thanks. Um, the NIB is... Could you is, just introduce yourself? Yeah, here? sorry, my name's Tim Farrah um, from TMF Associates. Uh, the NIB is telling us that the 4,000% that Sanjeev indicated as data growth in the next four years is some sort of fantasy. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, Sprint, Nextel, and Leap about whether they're planning for data growth in that sort of range or whether it's more like the 8 to 10 times growth in five years that... Uh, AT&T and T-Mobile have indicated? Well, I don't think I, I have a specific number that I can tell you we're planning against. What I can say is that uh, as we introduce smartphones, more smartphones, uh, and 4G capabilities, data growth is growing rapidly. Um, we can all talk about the different uh, projections that Intel and Cisco and a variety of others have and academics have and the FCC has used. But I think what's clearly true is that when you get more capability on your smartphone, you find ways to use it. Uh, the application 
uh, world is a great example of that. And even folks that are not sophisticated users, uh, I see them uh, downloading apps and finding ways to use it you never would have thought of before. So there's no question data growth is going to dramatically increase and continue to increase. And at Sprint, our focus, of course, is we were the first with a 4G network. And we're going to continue to expand that network. Um, our CEO has said we will have more to say about 4G later this year. Uh, and obviously, our focus is on wireless broadband and, and building for that wireless broadband future. Uh, I'm going to ask Parul. Parul, why don't you uh, take that? And I'll give, you, I'll give you the answer statistically from our company. But let's, uh, let's get Parul's view. Well, I don't have any statistics. I don't have anything to back this up. but. You know, I do think there'll be increased growth. I have no idea what that growth is. Uh, you know, I think even AARP, not AARP, Pew came out with a study that said even seniors are increasingly starting to use the internet. And so that, so mobile may be a way for them to enter the internet or enter that market. So um, I have, I, I can't give you any numbers, but I think you are starting to see even in other communities, whether it's communities of color or low income communities, if they have a mobile device, it's easier for them to access the internet. So I think if, prices go down, if they have choices, you'll start to see more growth. I just don't have the numbers, that's the data. Our, our customer base, Mesh, we have six million customers. Uh, 600,000 of them use uh, data modems, you know, little sticks, and they're averaging about three gigs, three gigabytes per month of consumption, pretty industry standard. Uh, we have about a million smartphone customers now. The smartphone customers average about 1.1 gigs per month. Uh, th this is actually what my group does <laughs> within the company, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a, 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 a guess right now because you can imagine, uh, based on your assumptions, how that drives demand for capacity and investment in your network, and uh, everybody's very anxious uh, about that. But what I can tell you, one, one uh, far-reaching point, data point we're looking at is if you uh, are familiar with the company in Sweden called Telesonera, uh, very, very early uh, 4G adopter, and you know, in the Nordic countries tend to be uh, pretty advanced. Uh, they're reporting in the range of 12 to 14 gigs per month on their 4G uh, networks. But again, it's driven by pricing. Uh, and so I don't want to uh, uh, give you a number that is absolutely going to happen. It's very elastic in terms of uh, usage and demand based on pricing. But we are, uh, like uh, Sprint and others, uh, planning for very, very significant uh, data consumption, whether it's 4,000 percent or thousand percent or three thousand I, I don't know but it's very significant growth Great. yes right here I'm, I'm Howard Buskirk with communications daily I we haven't heard that much about interference issues and I think that's probably most of what what most of the coverage has been you know lately on light squared is about trying to surmount these um, interference issues and I was just going to ask for an update on that and um, you know how surmountable are these issues? And then also, I didn't know if anyone of the other panelists wanted to comment on how does this speak to the interference issues that we're probably going to see in most of these bands that you know could be potentially opened up for wireless broadband. We'd like to talk about interference. Any new network that gets deployed has to resolve interference issues. Uh, especially in a crowded uh, spectrum environment that we are facing today. We have a history of working specifically with, uh, with the other players in the industry, very specifically GPS community. We've been working with them on spectrum and interference since 2003. Uh, so this is not something that is today is a three months ago or six months ago. And, and it's a process that, uh, that we believed that uh, at, at the time and through the period that has led to strong cooperation between GPS community and Light Squared and its predecessors. Fall of last year, uh, as we all know, uh, we were looking to get a specific waiver on integrated services and start offering terrestrial only devices to our customers. So this was a change at the device level that we were soliciting from FCC. 
not a change at the transmitter level, not at the change of how many base stations we put up, not a change on what kind of a network we design, a terrestrial and a satellite network. The waiver we were seeking had only one thing to do, which is what kind of device could we offer to our customer. That's when a set of concerns were expressed by GPS community. And what we agreed to do at FCC's uh, uh, direction is to work with the GPS community, go through proper technical testing process that we are in the middle of. We submit reports every month to FCC. There's one to be submitted on the 15th of this month. The final report, we're in the midst of testing right now. We're testing two, 300 devices total. The results will come out middle of next month. And uh, hopefully we will at that time see what the results are. We would understand the problem. And, uh, and as I said, we work with GPS community. I expect a lots of our devices to be GPS enabled. So I, I think it's, uh, it's a process we are going and engaging in, but it's a process, you know, I look at our cooperation with GPS industry is an eight-year-old cooperation, and we've been working with them since 2003 in the initial design of the network, initial power levels, interference, because we do reside very close to their spectrum. But I think the latest wave, we're in the midst of the process, and uh, less than 35 days away from uh, uh, submitting our final report to FCC. Will these reports be uh, made publicly available or anything? Uh, that's I right? think any report uh, that we submit to FCC will be a public document. Great. I could add, you know, in uh, the public interest groups, uh, you know, that we filed with, uh, this was in, re in reply to the uh, petitions for reconsideration by the GPS Industry Council and a bunch of you know, GPS companies. And, you know, we, we actually praised the uh, International Bureau uh, because we thought they struck just the right balance uh, because what they've done is they've allowed, um, they, take, they took a proactive approach to the GPS questions that were raised about interference. So they've, they've required that there be a, uh, a working group process with deadlines that's now ongoing and also required that, you know, that before their, you know, Light Squared actually begins any commercial sale of its service, that, uh, that that process has to be completed to the FCC satisfaction. So we thought that struck the right balance because it allows uh, Light Squared to continue on with its, uh, its testing and all its work while addressing this. Um, Although, you know, you know, more generally, you, you asked as well about, you know, this seems like it's always, you know, this predictable thing that every time there's a new, new entrant or new innovation that the incumbents scream, uh, you know, interference. And, and really, in, in the absence of uh, receiver regulation, it's going to be increasingly uh, imperative for the commission to, you know, to not allow incumbents to, to reduce their own costs by failing to design in you know, protections for neighboring uses that they know are coming. And, the, you know, in the GPS industry, we'll have to deal particularly with where health and safety is concerned with GPS, but they've known since 2003 that this was coming. And, you know, if they fail to do anything about it, it just, it just means that there's even, should be even more pressure on, uh, on, the, on the incumbent industry not to just sit back and let somebody else fix the problem, but they're going to have to shoulder the costs and the effort to make this transition because we can't let so much of the spectrum lie fa fallow because whether it's broadcasters with wide open TV receivers or GPS, the cheap GPS devices with wide open GPS receivers, you know, just in a sense pollute, um, you know, all the surrounding spectrum so that it's not usable. Thank you. We'll take one last that, question. Uh, actually, so, so go ahead. The other thing I, I would say too is that um, receiver standards are something that I think a number of members you know, are, are interested in because that is part of the question. I mean, that's a technical challenge that seems like we could solve and we really haven't, you know, it's kind of like building codes. You think about them periodically, not all the time. And I think the other um, 
part of that is, I think, you know, in for, for members like Senator Warner, I mean, I think we're also trying to differentiate between some of the narrow band devices and, and wide brand, like sensing issues. So for instance, the surveyors and people who, you know, agricultural um, entities, other folks, are gonna rely on GPS in a really different way from some of the mobile devices, and they have different challenges, which hopefully are gonna be resolved um, in this process. But, I mean, we think, you know, you, you kinda have to focus on what the problems are too, if we're gonna try and solve it, but. Thank you. We're gonna take one last question. I know I saw a hand up here. Uh, yes, right here. Uzama on EJ, on EJ Consulting. I'm a big fan of both openness and the wholesale model, um, but I wanted to follow up on a comment that was already made. What does it mean to the competitive landscape that Light Squared at this point is being held up as a competitor? And what, if anything, should a commission be doing about that as it tries to release more spectrum into the marketplace? And I, I just open it up to anyone. It's a, it's a great question, and, and I think it's important to, to take a hard look at, at competition from many different levels. I, you know, Sprint is not afraid of competition. We've, we've been battered by competition, and we've fixed a bunch of things that we didn't do well, and we've become a better competitor, and, and that's what competition's supposed to do. Now, again, yesterday I sat in a room where there was talk of, of vibrant competition, even with a T-Mobile, AT&T merger from uh, Bleep and, and Metro and Cell South and Light Squared and, and Clearwire and people yet to come. And, you know, that's a point, but at the same time, you've also got to look at scale. And, uh, and you've got to look at scope and you've got to look at market power. And I think that, that Sanji's uh, approach and the model and, and everything that, that we've talked about here today is, is great. The satellite spectrum is underutilized and needs to be better utilized. It's true in the S band as well as the L band. These are prime opportunities to bring additional competitive broadband wireless communications to the people of America. And the more competition we, we have there, the better. Um, you know, I, most people in this room realize that wireless started as a duopoly. And after 10 years, the GAO and the Congress and the FCC all concluded this isn't working. We were walking around with brick phones or transportable phones in bags. Prices were high. It was still really only something that executives could use. And as a result of auction authority and clearing 120 megahertz from microwave, uh, gave rise to, as, as was said earlier, a, a deliberate pro-competitive policy that gave rise to Sprint, gave rise to the predecessors of T-Mobile, and ushered in nearly 20 years of vibrant competition that have brought us the devices and capabilities we have today. Now we're on the verge of potentially undoing that. So I, at the one hand, the, the competition that lights grow to bring is very important. And all of the carriers involved uh, they are important. But at the same time, you know, to say that two carriers would control 80% of the market and a carrier that is not yet operating, um, you know, is, is, a, is an effective competitor and can discipline the prices, the innovation, and the quality of, of the potential duopolis is, is, a, is a far stretch. Can Sprint alone as a, as a kind of a mid-tier carrier in a, in a post-merger world of that duopoly, discipline their prices, discipline uh, their, their choices so that they continue to innovate the way uh, T-Mobile has innovated or the way we've innovated or, or the way that, that Sanjeev is going to innovate? No. So, you know, you have to break down that, that point a little bit and, and look at it in, in a realistic framework. So, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I, I'm going to go back to something that was said at the hearing yesterday, too. Uh, when the issue of prices came up, I was I was uh, surprised when when the statement was made that in order to drive down prices, what is needed is capacity. That capacity will somehow drive down prices, and you know I thought you know that'd be nice. If the more capacity you have, that would just result to lower prices. But ultimately, I don't think it's just capacity. I think Light Squared or any wholesale model does provide capacity. But ultimately, I think what drives down prices is competition or, like Michael said, just a completely regulated market. And so, you know, I think we need to look beyond just capacity. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I think a tr competition policy should look at also the other issues that I think some of the competitive carriers have, such as special access, roaming, handset exclusivity. So, you know, I think the idea of just capacity resulting to lower prices is, is not quite accurate. And what we'd like to see is, is a more robust competition policy. 
My, my, my view to answer your question is, uh, is something FCC needs to do is, is very, very simple, but I realize politically it's very difficult. They just need to make some decisions. Just, yeah. just bring some certainty. And I, and I know that's very difficult to do. I, 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 I appreciate that. I, I understand quite a bit of the, the process. But as, as, as our friend here started off the question, you know, there, there are a lot of innovative people out there. There is capital out there. And there are people that want to get going in wide-ranging, uh, innovative, competitive areas. And we're all paralyzed, in my view, uh, because of the FCC's inability to make some decisions. And again, granted, tough decisions. They're going to they're create some people that are very angry and some powerful political people that are very angry. Just do it so that we can get on and we can build this industry and we make decisions, even if we don't get all the decisions exactly the way we want them, which will never happen. That's OK. Make it clear. Put it down. We'll get going. We'll figure out solutions to these things if we can have some clear uh, direction out of the FCC. Great. Well, thank you very much. We're actually going to transition now to our final speaker. But please join me in, in thanking this illustrious panel. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So it's easier for us just to stay here, I think. Right? You guys can leave. I mean, unless you like to stare into oh, okay. bright lights. That's <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, you know, how to introduce Reed Hunt? You know, there's some like FCC commissioners and chairman, what have you, they, they disappear to oversee kind of the industries that just a few months ago they were uh, overseen in their jobs at the FCC. Others sort of dissipate into the ether, never to be seen or heard from again. And then there's Reed Hunt. <laughs> and I'm going to give you just a brief intro of some of the stuff that he's doing. Of course, he is former FCC chairman, as he was at the FCC 93 to 97. But he's also the principal at REH Advisors. He's the CEO of the Coalition for Green Capital. He's the chair of the Aspen Institute's International Digital Economy Accord. Uh, he's a member of, or was a member, I should say, of President Barack Obama's transition team. Uh, he's on the board of directors for Intel, Serious Materials, Intelligent Systems, the United Negro College Fund, uh, he has been an FCC leader who has remained incredibly involved in these spaces on a variety of different projects. And I think stands up as sort of a paragon of somebody that both knows the inside politics, the difficulty of making the hard decisions, as well as keeping one foot firmly planted in doing some really innovative work in this space. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Reed to kind of bring us home today. And I think the last question on competition policy is perhaps a, a great pivot point to what he's about to talk about today. Thanks, Thank you. Hi, folks. Nice to be with you. Thanks for giving me the ninth inning. Uh, thanks, Michael, uh, for, for including me. I, I'll be happy to take some questions after I give you my remarks. But I first want to comment on Mr. Ingram's uh, point about the FCC needing to make these hard decisions. Uh, all FCC chairs, in my experience, have been guided by the advice of Casey Stingle, the famous manager of the New York Yankees. Quote, the key to being a good manager is to make sure that the people who hate you don't meet the people who are undecided. The great historian Maitland famously said, what is now in the past was once in the future. I do not know if the era of unregulated competition in wireless communications is yet in the past. That is for others to say, but I can relate what was once in the future. Namely, I can tell you what Congress and the FCC hoped was the future of wireless communications in America at the pivotal time in the early 1990s when competition policy met the three forces of technological change identified by John Malone in a speech at the Yale School of Management in 1991. Digitization, microprocessors, and fiber optics. This seems as good a time as any to relate what was then thinkable but not inevitable. Some very able and rather cunning folks in Congress and in the White House, including but not limited to Ed Markey and Al Gore, inserted in the budget balancing bill called the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993, 
a provision that allowed the FCC to auction spectrum. One beautiful brushstroke in this fine work of legislative art was the command that the FCC not maximize revenue, but instead optimize for investment in innovation. And I certainly hope that those currently in charge of these issues will never neglect this huge, shiny pearl of wisdom. As a result, when I and my crew, uh, including Diane Cornell over here, uh, and many other uh, younger versions of those now in the commanding heights of government, when we arrived at the FCC in November 1993, we found waiting for us the opportunity to shape the market structure and to affect the market conduct and performance in wireless communications. Now that same month, the internet was in effect commercially invented due to advancers in browser technology championed by Mark Andreessen, among others, so you can see why I had the dream job of the Clinton administration. Indeed, the key to success in government is to be lucky enough to have fantastic events create amazing opportunities the day you walk in. Our first move was to stop the proceedings we inherited from the previous administration and rethink the strategy for wireless. Many people criticized me then for slowing down the auction, and another key to success in government is to ignore the wrong criticism and take the heart the right criticism. Of course, you do have to tell the two things apart. To make that decision about what was right criticism and what was wrong criticism, we had a great team working on the wireless issues. Some of the names are Pepper, Gibbs, Blair, Roston, Markley, Sinwell, Chorney, Quirrell, Kennard, Milkman, Cohen, Vaughn, Brinkman, Nakamura, Nakahara, Licht, Salat, a lot of familiar names. And in retrospect, I have to report that the decisions that this group made, with the major exception of a mistake I made that led to one of the biggest bankruptcies in history, these decisions turned out really well for America. Thanks to the rapid spread of mobile communications at prices about half those in Europe or Japan, to almost 100% of the population, consumers in the United States over the succeeding years obtained tremendous welfare gains, the economy showed high productivity, investors made enormous fortunes, and along with the measures that we took to promote the internet, we were able to make a completely unpredicted contribution to balancing the budget and creating income gains for all quintiles of the population. The 90s was the only decade in my adult lifetime in which that happened. In wireless, we made five main decisions, auction methodology, interconnection, standards, number portability, and deregulation. First, auction methodology. Thanks to a critical meeting with Michael Porter of Harvard, who was mentioned uh, with praise just a little while ago, and many days of cogitation by our team, we decided that auctions would be designed to create a very competitive market structure. That choice specifically repudiated the purposeful selection by previous FCCs of a two-firm market. The duopoly had proved not to innovate or to lower prices to affordable levels for most people. Indeed, since one half of the duopoly was the Baby Bell Company in each region, it appeared to us that the existing structure was designed to foster rent-seeking by the wireline access monopolists who had been severed from long distance by the modified final judgment of 1983, but who had been left with the wireless licenses that AT&T, the long distance company, inexplicably left them. To the end of creating a competitive market structure, we capped the amount of spectrum any firm could buy or own. Spectrum is a license to be in business. It's also true that the more a firm has, the less capital expenditures it must incur to create a functioning network. For both these reasons, a firm will in not invest in building and operating a network unless it has access to a certain amount of spectrum or can buy service from a wholesaler. However, if a wireless firm is earning its cost of capital, including a profit, then in the event it obtains more spectrum, it will lower its capital expenditures per megahertz and return more to its shareholders. If the goal is to benefit the economy through creating consumer welfare, jobs, and productivity gains, 
then permitting firms to obtain more than a sufficient amount of spectrum is not the wise policy choice. Our decision was to cap spectrum amounts per firm at levels we believed would maximize investment and competition. Our specific hope was that at least five firms would compete in most markets, and that hope was fulfilled. We also decided to hold simultaneous multi-round auctions of licenses for various geographically defined licenses. This innovative technique was derived by brilliant economists like Paul Milgram from work done initially by the same Nash, who was the subject of the movie Beautiful Mind. You can hear a nod to the FCC at the end of the film. I actually wanted to play myself in the movie, but Washington is not the real Hollywood. It is Hollywood for comparatively ugly people, and so that particular wish of mine was not fulfilled. Our goal was not to maximize the total amount bid, as I said, but to award licenses to those who valued the most in particular geographic markets. We also intended to allow firms in the auction itself to shape the geographical boundaries of their initial build-out plans. That's why we conducted multiple rounds, so that firms could form decisions about the geographic boundaries in the course of the auction itself. Of course, we also imagined that afterwards, by license transfer, firms would create national footprints. In general, we wanted to expedite the process of firms choosing their own geographic boundaries and moving, if they chose, to national footprints because we saw how painfully slow was the process that Craig McCaw had to go through in the previous decade to get to the same result, and slower still was the process that Nextel had to follow. All our wishes in the auction came true, saving the next wave bankruptcy story I mentioned earlier. Although even there, it's important to note that in a truly pro-competitive market structure, it is predictable that at least one firm will go under. Competition policy does not guarantee success to all competitors, and we were against bailouts. In a consolidated communications market, government, on the other hand, must consider saving failing firms in order to keep vital infrastructure up and running. In the competitive market that we hoped wireless would become, we strove to create a sufficient number of alternative firms to provide a backstop in any part of the country in the event one went down. Finally, we sold licenses, and we did not sell Spectrum as property held in fee simple absolute. In the event that circumstances such as overconsolidation in the future might warrant reconsideration of Spectrum ownership, then the FCC could, not sim could choose not simply to renew the granted licenses into the hands of firms that had too much. The second issue, we decided to set a very low price for wireless-to-wire -wire communications. The competition problem that we diagnosed was that 95% of homes had wireline communications due to decades of a universal service policy, whereas at that time no more than about 20% of the population had wireless phones. Most of the calls from a new wireless customer would therefore go to wireline termination points. And phone books actually only showed wireline numbers, so that wireless customers in those days had few ways to find each other. The rule of network effects was that each additional customer added value for all, but the owners of the wireline network would not be able to obtain any of that value. It would be transferred to the customers. Therefore, the owners of the wireline network had an economic incentive to obtain rents way higher than their costs by charging a high interconnection fee for calls coming in from the relatively nascent wireless network into the wireline network. So one of our very, very few rate-setting regulations was to set a very low transfer price. We were the only country in the world to adopt that particular policy. The goal was to extend the network effects of the wireline networks to all wireless customers, and that was intended purposely to increase the value for the customers of subscribing to wireless, even though at that time the subscription to wireless was of a much higher price than the subscription to wireline, partly because wireless technology was new 
and partly because of the subsidy programs for wireline. This decision about interconnection expedited the penetration of mobility because it increased the value of the wireless phone and because it precluded the wireline phones from increasing the price of having a wireless phone. After we adopted this rule, wireless companies could, we thought, and they did, move to offering big buckets of minutes, and that is when the wireless explosion really began. The third issue, standards, we did not select an air interface protocol. As a result, the market and not the government became a battleground among GSM, CDMA, and TDMA. San Diego should forever be grateful to me. In addition, this much criticized decision effectively precluded certain mergers for quite a long time to the benefit of our competition strategy. In the consolidating market, however, it is possible for different standards to have pernicious effects. That touches upon current events, so I will stop short of further comment. Fourth, numbers. We created many numbers for wireless firms. We made it easy for those firms to acquire numbers, and we tried to facilitate the process by which a customer could move a number from one provider to another provider. Numbers also could have been a way in which the wireline industry, which lawfully possessed an access monopoly, could have constrained the growth of wireless. In a related action, we encouraged the creation of useful public good numbers like 911 in wireless. Many people were upset by the death of the area code as a way to know the location of a line, but that was part of our overall plan to facilitate the death of distance. Fifth, since we trusted in competition as the policy that would cause mobile communications firms to exploit the advances of digitization over the airwaves and microprocessors in the handsets and fiber optics, which would be used for distance backhaul, it followed that we needed to deregulate mobile communications. We preempted California's attempt to set wholesale wireless prices. California sued, and our lawyers won the case. We declined to require build-out. We did not create a universal service policy for wireless. We did not stop firms from subsidizing handsets. We decided that with, if we had a robustly competitive access network market, then different firms would try different things to cause customers to be lured into the wireless space. We did not impose rigorous price regulation over backhaul in certain critical geographic locations. We did not impose stringent price regulation over roaming. We did not even require quality of service. In all these ways, we deregulated wireless, and the wireless industry in the United States became the most deregulated communications market of any communications market of any country in the world. Now it is a question whether competition still will produce solutions to problems that are felt by consumers and society, or whether regulation needs now to be put into place to address such issues. Current events loom large as to this enormously important topic, so I will bring to a close my excursion into the thinkable past. Thank you very much. Do you want to take some questions? I'm happy to. Now, just a question. I heard that speech earlier. <laughs> Jim Snyder. Hi, Jim. Hi, Reed. Uh, SpectrumBS.info. My question is, what percent since 1994 of the rights that the SEC has given away have been auctioned? You, made, you alluded to next wave. That would bring it down to roughly 25%. In your book, after you left the SEC, you talked about the broadcasters and, and the magnitudes of Giveaway sin that bring it down to under 50 percent. MSS, we're talking about roughly 30 billion dollars. Are you you're answering uh, your own question? Well, That's I'm what I do. You, I would estimate under 10 percent. What would you estimate of the receipts uh, uh, from the giveaway of rights that the FCC has done since 1994? Since you talked. How about much money has the FCC obtained? What percentage 
of the rights given away has the, FCC, the public received in auction receipts? Would you estimate? I haven't added it up. Would you estimate it's under 50 percent, under 10 percent? I don't know. I don't know. But if you have the answer, I'm happy to hear it. Okay. I would estimate under 10 percent. <laughs> okay. Are there any other statements or questions? <laughs> Jim knows a lot. I'm, not, I'm happy to learn from him. Anyone else? Tim Ferrer, TMF Associates. Just to follow up on the, the question I asked earlier about you know, the alleged spectrum crisis or not, uh, you know, what are the implications for the FCC uh, if the spectrum crisis is overblown and it ends up being like the internet doubling every 90 days like we had 10 years ago? You mean 10 years ago when Metcalf said it was growing so fast it would break right away and then it yeah. didn't? Yeah, I mean, if the FCC takes a set of decisions based on a set of assumptions that turn out in retrospect, maybe they're not correct. Well, you know, what are the repercussions of that for people who are on the panel, for the FCC itself, et cetera, et cetera? So as I was, as I was trying to say here, uh, there's, I think, two useful ways to think about a spectrum license. First, it's a license to be in business. So you can start an applications business without getting a license. You can, you can, in the old days, be an internet service provider. We had 5,000, and the FCC, that was the other place where we were massively deregulatory. The FCC never said you have to get a license to be an internet service provider. We granted more than a quarter million ham radio licenses, but we never said you had to be an internet service provider. In fact, a big part of the FCC's budget, it turned out, I discovered, was funded by the ham radio operators. Thank you all very much. But we passed up the chance to uh, uh, get fees from uh, internet service providers. So by and large, if you just think about it, it's not a great idea to have to license an American in order to let them go into business. But in the case of Spectrum, first of all, that is what Congress said that we had to do. And number two, there is an argument to be made that a judicious policy to minimize the cost of interference problems is a useful one. That's what you, Sanjeev, were just talking about. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's the first thing to think about with respect to Spectrum. It's a license to be in business. And so it's sort of axiomatic that you'd want to have a market in which you could give as many people licenses who are willing to show up and get them get them in an auction and pay for them, right? So consequently, that is why, just for that reason alone, you'd want to have spectrum caps so that you could have more people decide to be entrepreneurs in the space. But as these folks, I didn't hear everything they said, but they said a lot of smart things. And one of the points I think that more than one was making is that if you take a, uh, a, a network access uh, company and you give it more spectrum, then it's going to need less CapEx to provide the same volume of bandwidth. So it's a trade-off. Uh, here's a, uh, uh, the way I like to think about it, because I don't have to use any math to think about it this way. Uh, there's only a certain amount of uh, dirt uh, that constitutes Manhattan, and there's only a certain amount of spectrum that uh, uh, God gave the FCC to sell or regulate. Uh, for example, light waves, I always regretted, are not in the jurisdiction of the FCC. That would have been something. Uh, the idea that you would have to ask me for permission to see is something that I used to um, think about late at night. In any event, um, <laughs> Manhattan, there's only a certain amount of dirt. So if you divide Manhattan into blocks of real estate that are owned by competitors, what they do is they build higher and higher buildings. They put more and more capex in to handle greater and greater volume. If you're pro-CapEx, pro-jobs, pro-innovation, that you're willing to do. But if you give somebody a lot so small that they can't build a big building, then you've overshot your mark. So you do have to, if you're the government and you're in the allocation and license selling business, you've got to get some sense of what the trade-off is. So working with Michael Porter and all of our economists, we came up with a really, really easy rule of thumb. Could we grant in the spectrum auctions enough spectrum to make five firms plausible? That was a rule of thumb. If the answer was that we couldn't convince ourselves that that would work, 
well, then we had to rethink. But we did convince ourselves that that would work. And the reason lies in these same technological advances that I was telling you about, because it, the happy circumstance in the early 90s is that we were exactly at the inflection between analog and digital, which meant that people could do more with the same amount of money. Any other questions? All right, thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, thank you all, and uh, please sign our sheet if, we're, if you're not on our normal uh, invite list, and thank you for coming.